You are listening to Innovative Minds with Melanie Francis, where we talk to some of the top thought leaders, business leaders, and marketers around the globe. Tune in every Thursday and spark your mind. And now, let's get into it. Welcome back to Innovative Minds. I have Havard Lilibo here with me, who is a serial entrepreneur. He has raised over $140 million in startup funding. He's involved in some really, really cool startups from deep tech, AI, nanotech. We'll go into his startups. Super cool, super interesting. He's had two exits. And the most interesting thing about Havad that I really wanted to get into is he's like a hyper LinkedIn fan and that's how we came across each other but he's also raised six million euro from LinkedIn itself and I was curious to really get inside of his mind as to why he's so invested into the platform how has he been able to make the platform so successful what is his mindset what does it actually take and you know how he's actually evolving his content game to make sure that LinkedIn continues to work for him. So welcome, Havad. Thank you, Mel. <laughs> well, Havad, let's get right into it. I mean, what, where, did it, where did this LinkedIn fascination actually start with you? You know, so is it after you've had an exit, you're sitting there going, oh, well, I'm just going to sit here and start raising some money. Like, you know, how does someone get so fascinated with LinkedIn and going, oh, let me raise money here? What was the journey? So the, I, I was actually uh, using LinkedIn since 2004, which is very, very, very early. But it was, of course, a very different platform at that time. But I kind of built my network sort of step-by-step uh, step, uh, for, I guess, 15 years, <laughs> uh, which were sort of, yeah, personal network. Uh, then I got challenged by a, a lady that said, uh, you, you are involved in so much crazy cool stuff. Why don't you start to post and sort of show the stuff you're thinking about, the stuff you're engaged with? Uh, because I want to know, I want to learn. <laughs> and and I was like, okay, who who wants to know about this? Come on. <laughs> so I, I kind of picked up uh, on LinkedIn and I started to to post some of the stuff that I thought was interesting. And it, it, this was like for me, it was like okay, I, actually interesting because I started to pick up some very cool conversations with people in my network. And I especially remember one guy that uh, was uh, very fascinated of uh, what I was doing. And uh, so he, he asked me to, to jump on a call. And uh, this was uh, one investor. And I was like, huh, that's interesting. <laughs> this was like six months before uh, sort of funding in Nanize. And we talked about Nanize. We talked about uh, sort of the, the vision behind this and uh, and then I kept on sort of posting yeah, about every week uh, something uh, something cool. And that made like a an, sort of an impression. I, I was sort of, sort of continuously there. I was sort of active and posting interesting stuff. And that kind of built my personal reputation or personal sort of... Or he, he got to understand who I was without sort of having another meeting. And... When got we got to the funding round of, uh, of Nanice, it was super quick. Like in three weeks, we put about a million euro together, uh, which is like fantastic uh, short, short time. Usually exactly. it takes 12 months to do these funding rounds. And all of a sudden you could do this in like three weeks. I was like, wow, that's really, really powerful how you can use LinkedIn to sort of build your brand, build, share insights. And LinkedIn is telling kind of your story without you being there. And so it really dawned on me, sort of this power that LinkedIn has for working as a founder, uh, working with investors. Yeah, it's super interesting because you're talking about this conversion cycle and how you've been able to shorten that. And that's really powerful. I mean, I find that a lot through building my personal brand. By the time I have a conversation with someone, they have already know that I'm pretty much 90% sold. It's a one close, it's a one call close deal kind of thing because they've kind of seen you, they've heard you on your podcast, similar to us. Like you've got, they've kind of got this confidence about you. They don't need a lot. So 
it's mm. just shorter. And I've talked to my competitors and they're like, what do you mean one call close? I mean, you're not sh- selling a $200 item. You know, you're selling a pretty reasonable, decent item on the market. And I think because they don't have that personal brand, brand or trust, sometimes you have to build that over multiple calls and touch points and people still like afraid to sign up for a very long time or give a substantial amount of cash to you. So I think in the same way, it sounds like with you, with funding, you were kind of actually nurturing the funding purpose um, without even realizing you were doing it, it seems, initially. Yeah, in the start. Yeah, in the start, absolutely. And then then this power really sort of dawned on me and I was like, wow, I, I need to understand this better. I need to look into sort of all the, how LinkedIn actually works. and. I, I really sort of upped my game uh, on LinkedIn to to yeah to test out really, and it absolutely worked. Kind of, I saw this in in company after company that uh, wow, this is actually playing out really effectively. And maybe people think that it's kind of crazy to do to be so active on LinkedIn. You're a founder, come on, you're supposed to work, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it, it is an investment to to do this, but I think it plays out very nicely because. Every founder knows that funding a company is actually super hard work. I used to say that uh, if you're world class, you can do this in six months. And and so, some founders think that, well, this is maybe a two, three months thing. I was like, then you're super lucky. Like my experience is typically 12 months. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, I, I was like, I'm not even world class. Come on. <laughs> yes. Yes. But then, Wait. then I actually saw that sort of with LinkedIn, I couldn't actually improve the speed of the funding rounds actually quite significantly. Yeah, got it. When you say I upped my game, you know, after I realized in Nanice that I was able to have a really super short conversion cycle of three weeks when it typically would take 12 months. What do you mean by that? Like, how did you actually up your game from that point on? Yeah, so there were two sort of concrete steps. The first one was that I, I got super curious about how does actually LinkedIn work? I wasn't understanding sort of uh, really anything before this. It was more uh, sort of, I was posting, I was getting like an average uh, 1,800 views on my post, which is really nothing. Mm-hmm. But I didn't understand sort of how this actually works. So I, I kind of had to read up on stuff and uh, understand the algorithm, understand sort of the comments and the value of the comments. That was like one of my big epiphanies that sort of comments, it was really a key key thing for driving uh, views on uh, on LinkedIn. And so I, I, that was like the first uh, thing. So I, I already had this sort of this about the weekly posting one to two, maybe three times per week. Yeah. Um, trying to sort of produce, yeah, well, uh, insights and, and uh, share comments and not just for, for views, but sort of share who I am. Uh, what am I sort of in, in enthusiastic about? What, uh, what uh, triggers my interest? You actually see... Uh, like a small little community sort of growing up around that because people interact, they, they share ideas with you and uh, you, you actually start to get a lot back also when you do this. Mm. So mm. that was like the first step. And then the second one was that sort of working with you guys. You were one of those one call close, uh, Mel. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, well, I, because I, I really thought it was very interesting what you guys were doing. And, uh, and we sort of put this into a system and uh, it's... Every Thursday, uh, nine o'clock, uh, there's, now there's a post and we, we work on these posts for even months ahead. So that was definitely a big step up also. So it, you started actually investing yourself into understanding and then you actually partnered with someone to go, I want to go next level of creating cut through content. And I remember when we were talking and you are like, you know, I really want this. Um, I want to be different on the platform, I want creativity. And is that, do you think that's like sort of evolvement of the game for people that are like, okay, I'm showing up, I'm doing content, but if they really want to up their game, they have to put something out there that's quite cutting edge that stands them out from the rest of the feed that's going on? Or, you know, is that like, you know, is that the evolvement, do you think, as a content creator on that platform that you have to bring in creativity more and more to stand out? There's a lot there. Yeah. Well, I think that definitely helps uh, on sort of standing out, but sort of in the first place, I, uh, there are so many people that un- don't understand the value of LinkedIn yet. And they are not, so so many founders, where are you? Come on. It's like, 
they don't, they don't understand how important LinkedIn is for connecting with investors and building a personal brand and sort of, um, yeah, both and not only for investors, for, for customers, for employees, for partners. Uh, so there's so much more than just investors. Uh, so I, I think it's sort of realizing the power that LinkedIn has for showing your own story, uh, tell it, well, and especially when you're not in the room, <laughs> you, you kind of build these relationships. It may take three months, it may take six months, maybe even more, but you start to sort of show up in someone's feed and you, you make an impression. Sometimes they read that, but what I hear is from many investors, they actually read everything I post. I was like, wow, wow. <laughs> because they yeah. find it interesting. They, they said it's quality content and that's, well, that's my target. Uh, I, I want to produce co quality content. Uh, and, uh, and then I think there's also a difference because there are so many people that are sort of selling, 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 and it's like me, 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 uh, <laughs> On, uh, on LinkedIn and I try to sort of provide insights and in a sort of paid forward style and I'm not actually not selling anything uh, per yeah like I, I, I need to have this number of views or I need to have this type of conversion this is uh, really the long game um, and, and yeah building your personal brand well a lot of founders and say that well how do I know that this will actually work okay like you're saying that you raise investment, but okay, I've already raised investment. Why should I, you know, if investment's not a thing, people just want sales. They just want the ROI from the platform. So they come in with the thing going, well, Mal, how, and Richard gets this too. How do I know that I'm going to get a ROI? So I put in X over six months and how am I going to extract Y? You know, it has to be more than that six months. And there's no yeah. guarantee that it's in six months or 12 months or 24 months. It really depends on your product, your niche, how the business world is doing. You know, it's not, I, I can't say to you because you put in 30K, now you're going to get 5X that no. <laughs> by doing this in this time frame yeah. because every industry sales cycle is different. Every niche you're talking to, every objective is different. How you already have a network, how much warmth is your network already? There's so many ingredients yeah. Hmm. to that but people do demand that and I, i'm curious to know did you not also have that demand ever from it or is it you know or, or what do you say to that demand and how do you overcome that objection that maybe comes inside of someone it's it's, it's a natural thing i put in money i want out x or i put in time well, yeah so money. yeah of course so, so for me it was sort of crystal clear the value of what i'm doing because i could see that in the interactions with investors with potential investors and with employees with uh, so so it was very tangible in that sense so i am not sort of calculating uh, roi on my time on, on linkedin um because this is about storytelling is about showing who we are um and you have to stand out and but the good thing is that it's actually super easy to stand out yeah uh, and uh, linkedin is uh i think is a phenomenal platform for being able to stand out so, so what's the value of that? Well, that may be the difference uh, you succeeding with a funding round or not. Like if you're raising 2 million euros uh, and, and you're successful in doing that, uh, well, then it's high value. <laughs> if, you, if you struggle, then may, maybe you think it's a low value. But um, I think eventually this is like playing the long game and, and sort of being visible also getting actually alternatives on, on the investor side. When you're working with funding, you, you want to have alternative, alternatives always. And that's, that's sort of the only way to ensure that you find the right partner and the, the right type of deal and, and structure for uh, when, when you want to fund things. You absolutely need alternatives. What is the process then for you to get and bank the six mil in euros that you did from LinkedIn, what was the process? What was it? Was there like, okay, I'm going to go and connect with X amount of investors. Like were there, you know, numbers, was it just content you were playing and hoping that, you know, the investors would see it. What was sort of, you know, the process in how you were able to go and do that? Or was it just, you're kind of like, you know, playing the content game and hoping that someone's going to come and, see you 
No, it was actually quite a deliberate uh, strategy because I reached out to a number of sort of family office and angel type of investors. And I've been working with the venture capital companies for seven, eight years uh, before that. So I just knew that that wasn't sort of fitting to my new uh, sort of early stage startups uh, at that moment. So I, I was quite laser focused, I would say, on the type of investor I wanted in my network. And then, so I reached out to yeah people who kind of fit that profile, not sort of expecting that uh, or, or trying to sell something immediately. Uh, that wasn't the plan. It was more to sort of get connected and kind of gain gain visibility uh, over some time so that they could understand more who I am based on that, eventually maybe do something together. And so this, this absolutely worked out. Uh, mm. And so you don't need like 5,000 or 10,000 people in, in your network. You, you actually only need uh, maybe 10, 20 uh, if you have the right ones. Now, the problem is always to figure out who are the right ones. Right. <laughs> so so um, you need to, to sort of build the audience in a sort of deliberate way, I think. And that is not sort of the CEO guys who want to sell you uh, or everyone is trying to reach out on LinkedIn as like uh, uh, you get these contact messages. That's, that's not your audience. So I think it's, it's very important to be um, aware of um, who is your primary aud audience and how can you sort of build a tribe and how, how can you actually reach the, these uh, people? Yeah. Um, One thing you said was I really knew who my ideal investor is. You know, and I, I guess I'm curious to know what is your ideal investor profile there? Well, f first, I would say it's someone with integrity and trust. Um, this is like so important. Uh, this is super important for me, uh, but I, I'm also looking for this in, uh, in, in the investor. It's someone I can actually work with and, and trust. And then, well, obviously someone with the resources. This may be a sort of, yeah. 10 to 200 million euros, sort of that, that kind of range. Then preferably someone who has sort of been a founder before, sort of been through this journey or, and, and that sort of have a family office, sort of doing some investment and, uh, and then sort of the, the personal connection, uh, is very important to kind of bring sort of a LinkedIn initial relationship to 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 talk to some of these people um and and then sort of what is quite key is also someone who's able to make decisions relatively quickly and so that they they trust their gut they you you are on the same wavelength and and uh, you feel that uh, this is a, a good match and you want to move relatively quick so i'm not uh, sort of against uh, sort of doing dds and like due diligence uh, and these type of things so but I don't want like a six month uh, due diligence process. Uh, it's just way, way, way too long. Uh, and I've had a number of those before. So, so I'm sort of quite experienced also in that. <laughs> but um, so, so this resourceful, um, quick decisions and, and good people, I think yeah. kind of sums, uh, sums it up. Sometimes investors like come in and they like really excited and then they kind of pull you in and you're kind of excited and then nothing. And it's like dead silence. And then they play again the same game and say, you know, I've been thinking about you, you know, how can I get involved, da, da, da. Have you seen these type of investors come in? And it's like you can't really tell are these people real? Like you know that they've got, you know, money, but the way that you're kind of sometimes interacting with them, it's like they're all in in a minute and then they're all of a sudden cold or not cold, but, you know, like kind of standing you up and you're not even the one chasing potentially right but they're just yeah. coming in and i guess what's your advice on when you kind of experience people or investors like that is that something you steer away from or is there a game that you play with them and also just keep them you know warm over there and utilize it once they're ready yeah i don't actually have that many um such people in in my my network or sort of or i, I don't have that sort of experience too, too often with investors. So for me, it's typically I check in with investors sort of every now and then sort of have a friendly chat and, 
what's going on in these type of conversations. I prefer to sort of have these type of yeah, friendly things. Yeah. Uh, if, if I have sort of any type of red flag on an investor, I'll shut down that uh, communication right away. So there are absolutely not every investor I want to work with. <laughs> yeah. It's not about the money. It's actually much more about the relationship um, and that you can... I, th I think uh, I even said this before that it's like a marriage you and it, or so sometimes worse than a marriage <laughs> because uh, once you 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 get into a, you get an investor into your company you you have to live with them for the length of that company uh, and especially if it's a sizable investor so then it's super important that this is actually a good investor uh, so it's not about sort of <clears throat> just getting in any type of capital it's very important to qualify the investors that they're actually good partners to work with. I have the power to say no, no to people. And if you don't have alternatives, then you're really in a bad situation because you you don't want to accept people you don't like. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. How do you get into such a calm state and such a long state? You know, was that always the case for you or did that happen after an exit? Because it's really sort yeah. of, you know, your state of mind when I deal with you, you're yeah. very pleasant. You're very, you know, you're very much like, okay, it's long term. And I guess with founders as they're kind of going into cycles of, you know, pressure, especially right now with yeah. the funding environment, it is yeah. a tough environment for founders. So how do you have that mindset with everything that's going on? And, you know, what could you share with other founders on mindset? Hmm. Yeah, that's a that's an interesting one. I think it's sort of a for me, it's like having inner peace, and it maybe kind of sounds silly, but this is actually super important. Sort of being grounded in yourself, uh, and how how do you um, how are you true to yourself? How do you sort of do things your way? How, how do you find balance in in life? So, so I'm I'm sort of reflecting actually quite a lot on these uh, these things, and this this inner peace is for me uh, super important. And like I, I'm I'm not sort of easily stressed out, or or because I know that there are always alternatives, or we'll figure out a way. And maybe I'm well, maybe I'm definitely an optimist <laughs> and sort of uh, enthusiastic about challenging status quo disrupting creating a better future uh i uh, i have this curiosity to sort of dig deep uh, i have this passion and uh, this uh, to, to to find these answers and and find brilliant people uh and and i love to have these conversations with the brilliant people so for me it's it's also sort of important to both qualify some of these sort of potential ideas and, and now I sort of kind of have enough with my sort mm -hmm. of five startups, but but it's even more important actually to say no to to things and uh, sort of stop doing. And well, how do you do that on a startup? So my my impression is is a lot of people sort of just jump on an idea way too quickly. And it's like, yeah, is this idea actually worth your time? And it's like next five, ten years of your life. Well, that's a big decision. Come on. And uh, you you should do some proper uh, fundamental work to ensure that you, that you're actually spending the time in in a in a good way. So after my my ex is like uh, five years ago, I I was in this mode of like what should I do? Now I can sort of I don't have to be employed. What should I do? What's worthy of my time? What's what's really cool to be doing? I think I went through like hundreds of ideas. And I discarded like 99% uh, or 98% maybe of, of them. And yeah, to, to kind of find things I, I, I got really passionate about. And and how do you get passionate about something? It's it's very easy to sort of be, uh, to be blind actually, to, to be passionate about something that actually isn't worth being passionate about. But you kind of get locked into your own mindset as... Uh, I see many, many founders, they just love their solution. Yeah. And for me, it's like, it's actually much more about loving the problem than loving, loving the solution. Because if you understand the problem really deep, then you see that there are, there are actually many ways to solve that problem. And well, is there a way where you can sort of combine 
solving a problem, creating value for your customers, and where you can also take some value for yourself and, and create a business. And, and that's kind of the sweet spot for, uh, for the things I'm doing. And I, I want to do this with, together with people. So people is very important for me in, the, in all my startups, like meaningful connections with business partners. Well, of course, with my family. And these are uh, super important things to have in place before you actually put all your resources into uh, one startup. So knowing that there are millions of ideas out there is like a kind of key question. Why do you go for exactly this one? Well, it's better be a really good one. Don't waste your time, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, the big, biggest takeaway you've just given me is be in love with the problem more than the solution. Mm -hmm. um, that's a really good way to think about it. You know, that's a really, really key takeaway because... I think sometimes we do fall in love with the solution, the outcome, the oh, result. Absolutely. It's just, absolutely. you can't that, help it. Yeah. No, and, and that's, uh, as, as founders, that's the typical thing to do. We, we love our solution and we, we get so blindfolded wow. uh, because, because of our own mental traps. Do you know when I've flown a plane every time? Like there's one problem it's always pissed me off and I just hate, why don't we have Wi-Fi? on the plane that is mm -hmm. just consistent. And when I'm taking big flights, like why can't I, you know, be on there and do really, you know, work because sometimes you're like on that flight for 14 hours and you don't want to watch Netflix. You don't want to watch what's on TV. And I'm so into that problem for years and years, but because this, it seems like it's such a big, like, I'm like, why is it so hard to solve? Someone's already obviously solved it. Oh, you know, it's got to be someone's working on this. And then you get on the plane again. I'm like, what the hell? Two years of COVID and they still haven't, you know, solved this. <laughs> and I'm so into the problem that at the end of the day, I'll be like, no, focus on this, focus on a business that's got the solution already built or the solution. It's just easier. But if you are really obsessed with the problem, you can just become obsessed with it, right? And I think that's that's the crux, something that I've really learned from you is, if you think of it like this, do I love the problem? Do I even understand the problem? You know, yeah. sometimes and, I'm and doing business and I don't even understand the problem. No, no, and and absolutely, and that's that's even the, the thing for me. So when I when I start to investigate a problem, I I know that I don't understand everything. Like, I, and and uh, how do I sort of convince myself about is this a worthy problem? Well, I talk to global experts. I talk to customers. I talk to experienced investors. And that's a, a, a way to get feedback, external feedback into my brain so that I can uh, make a better assessment uh, about that problem. So if I only sort of sit in a room and think for myself, I, I'll never get those new ideas or new perspectives. And, yeah. and this, I, this I do actually very early uh, on in uh, when, uh, well, after I was sort of getting quite enthusiastic about uh, an idea, I, I run this sort of rapid cycle of, getting lots of feedback and, and then I do a competitive analysis, uh, extremely early. So I want to map out every solution that's in this space for solving this problem. Uh, because once I know sort of, uh, who is there, how are they funded? Uh, what's your competitive landscape? That's a, that's also a super important, uh, aspect of it. Is this actually a worthy problem? So if you have like billion dollar competitors, well, okay, you, you may still want to do it, but then, you know, you have to do something on the funding to, <laughs> to kind of, yeah, not lose the game because competing with a billion dollar company is actually super hard. <laughs> and, and I guess it's super important that you actually have this knowledge when you're going in for your funding round and you're having these conversations that they actually get to know you as someone that knows the industry. So going back yep. to the race that you would do on LinkedIn when you get on these calls, I'm curious to know, like how, what are you sharing? Are you sharing with the purpose of, Hey, this is how well researched I am already. This is what I've been doing. And do you keep the conversation quite focused on the startup you're focused on probably getting funding from? Are you, or are you just connecting on a human? Like how much of it is, I guess I'm yeah. trying to understand is strategical here that, you know, you are hopping on a call and you have got the research for a startup, or do you kind of go with the flow, see where their interest is, talk about your multiple startups, and even though you know you might not need funding for X or Z, 
mm. and you've got a need for three, do you kind of focus in on that? Is it strategic at all for you or you just kind of go with the connection? No, it's, it is absolutely strategic and it sort of, this is for me playing the long game. So I, I want to connect with good people and I want to actually qualify them also when I talk to them, it, are they potentially good people to work with? So it's not so much about me, actually. It's I, I want to understand who's on the other side. Is it something, someone I, I want in my network and I want to, uh, to, uh, yeah, to potentially work with? So, and that's a very different mindset than sort of going in and sort of pitching, pitching, pitching. So I want that, that conversation going. And that's why I, I don't typically pitch with pitch decks because I want these conversations. I want to know what, what would this person be like to work with? Are they asking good questions? So it's, it's actually, a, it's a whole strategic side of this also, but of, of course I don't necessarily sort of lay that out plainly, but those are sort of the questions going through my mind when I, when I meet with new people, I, I, I try to sort of figure out if uh, this is uh, someone I'd like to work with. And I know, I just know that sort of my companies yes. are good enough. So, so that's not the question. So, so it's, I don't need sort of validation from, from that investor if if my id is good enough or or not well if they like it fine if they don't well i go to the next one so i know my ideas are are really great so I, i'm searching out for those investors who who understand the value and sort of get enthusiastic about the things i'm enthusiastic about fantastic so you have said that you know the 140 mil raise that you've done over time six six of that was linkedin where did the other portion then, you know, how did you do the other portion? How did that work? What was that approach in comparison? So that's like starting 20 years ago when I was first a founder. I funded up my first company in, well, right after my master of uh, master in business and economics, uh, okay. I was 22 years old uh, and I started my first uh, company. And that was like um, yeah, about a million euro funding what was it what was the company so this was actually working with uh, video advertising back in oh. 2002 so that was super early <laughs> wow and uh, and we had a, a technology that could uh, give much better quality video uh, over sort of a very limited uh, bandwidth which was a huge thing back then <laughs> like uh, oh. you you had really crappy granular video uh, so mm. we're, we're actually doing a, a pretty cool thing uh, on the technology side. So we could inc uh, we could improve the, the the video quality significantly compared yeah. to the sort of the standard of the time. And we actually made a global eBay campaign uh, for for eBay in the US with our oh. technology, and it launched in the UK, Tokyo, and the US, and uh, yeah, in 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 Europe. So and we thought. Now we've kind of really hit the sort of golden customer as like a fantastic proof case uh, for us. But then my funding round actually fell fell apart and I, I had like 10, I think it was like 10 employees at the time. Mm. And the two investors pulled out of my uh, the DD process we were having and I had no alternatives and I just had to lay off my people and uh, it was, yeah, it eventually it went, uh, we, we closed down the company. Wow. Uh, so that was actually quite a brutal learning <laughs> from from early on. So after that, I went to uh, to join a stock listed company. I was CF sort of like local CFO or sort of finance manager for eighty eight employees. Um, we grew that to three hundred and thirty, more than a uh, hundred million dollars in, in revenue. It was a physical production facility, and that was for solar cells, actually producing solar cells. There I got this idea about how sort of beware solar cells. So it's a B-class solar cells. Uh, okay. There was there was no one who, who was working with that on a sort of on a global scale. What should you do with your B-class uh, production? So mm -hmm. I went to VC uh, North Zone Ventures and uh, asked if we um, yeah if this was something that was worthy of uh, their time and interest. I really liked this. Uh, it was like five five percent of the total production for solar cells that ended up in this uh, class and nobody was actually focusing or, or trying to get any value out of this so this was um then i i also had the idea to use advanced lasers and uh to to kind of fix part of this uh to to kind of get a get a 
a cell uh, back. Um, okay. And we what, have this. What does uh, it mean, solar cell? What does it mean? You know, working with so solar the, cell. The, the the physical solar cell like in in a solar panel you have yeah 60 uh solar cells okay so the yeah. actual actual 6 inch solar cells oh, so okay. we we produced them back in 2000 oh, yeah, 6 2007 and uh, and then we set up the, so we we I had this idea for the startup that would take it, it was 4 million euros to build the production line so there's like no way to do a sort of step-by-step -step thing. You actually mm. need a lot of funding to do this. So I, I went to, to Norson Ventures to, to get the initial funding for the company and grew that from my ID to 180 employees and 35 million euro revenue. It was actually quite a success for a long time yeah. <laughs> until the solar market started to crash in 2011. And, uh, and it was just brutal. <laughs> and uh, and basically the whole uh, European uh, space was uh, uh, solar players in the Euro Europe were were put out of business because uh, Chinese were deliberately taking this industry, and uh, so we were wiped off uh, off the sheet really. <laughs> um, wow. and so you didn't that was... get an exit in that one. You just no no so that that was like eighty million euros uh, about that we raised for this uh, company. Wow. Uh, it was so, your, uh, that, that was after you sort of had this learning from this other company you worked as employee for, you got fascinated and then you yeah. saw an opportunity and then you went and yeah. created your second yeah. company. Yeah. yeah. So that was my second. So that was like 80 million euros, uh, I think, uh, in, in total financing and which is, which is kind Huge. of crazy. <laughs> and that was yeah. in your, and you were always dealing with VCs back then. And that's what you kind of distinguished yeah. that yeah. as you start getting into a different early stage and, yeah. and maybe it changes. Maybe we'll hear some more from you that back then you could go to a VC, throw an idea and collect that sum of money. Is that different as your journey goes on? Well, I'll let you tell it. No, the, yeah, so, so VC funding is still uh, very attractive when you want to do sort of larger rounds and, and sort of working with VCs, I think is it's a really good strategy because you, you get really good people on board that are knowledgeable and very experienced in uh, starting up and scaling businesses. So I think uh, for it's it's a really good partner to, to bring on board uh, for for any type of founder. But it's quite hard to get VC uh, on board because it's typically like six to twelve months uh, process. So for me, it was from Innotech uh, Solar, then the company name. Uh, the company I founded uh, from from uh, when I started it until I had the first funding round in place, it was twelve months. And uh, typically, in, in, in the average funding round was twelve months. Yeah, uh, it took a lot of time and resources to to uh, do these funding rounds. So, what was the next company after the solar company? And then, I, then I worked with the solar parks. I think we raised like seven million euros to um, to acquire solar parks and uh, get them up in shape. Uh, so these were actually built solar parks with owners who didn't understand sort of the solar asset. Right. Uh, so what we did was purchase them actually cheap, get some the, our yeah, good competence uh, into the game and then sort of uh, improve performance actually radically. It's like buying a house uh, really cheap and shine, shining right. it up. So I did that for a year, and then I was I took that company public uh, in 2016. Then I adopted my my girl from Colombia, uh, and I went over there, and life changed in a big way. Wow! <laughs> and uh, and then I was uh, doing a, a data center project in Colombia. Uh, no, no, just... in 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 Norway, in Norway. Norway. So so I was. After uh, actually in the last two years of Innotech, I was uh, sort of starting to to think about uh, what kind of uh, what, what should I do if Innotech didn't last because I kind of feared that it, we had a really a really hard time in the last few years uh, at Innotech. So it was like, what, what should I do afterwards? And Is this the, the thing... company that you took public though? So at that point. You've, no, so you've, you've... Uh, so this this company that I took public that was uh, what I did like right after Innotech for one, about one year and 
and then uh, I adopted my girl from Colombia. And then when coming back, I was working on the, what could I actually do in sort of my local community, uh, sort of in, in, in the immediate future, uh, immediate uh, <laughs> um, yeah. surrounding that could create value. So that I didn't have to travel that much because I wanted to be at home with my, uh, with my family. Yeah, um, right. And and then so I there started. There was a real to... mindset shift change as soon as you've adopted yes. your girl. <laughs> so you're totally yeah. now thinking, how can I stay close? So there must be, as an entrepreneur, there's a huge moment for you as a man, as someone that now wants to has a family, and so this is like a big deal. So you're now thinking totally different of what you can do and stay close. Yeah. Absolutely. It was a big shift because I didn't want to travel that much. I was like the year before I adopted the, my, my girl, I was traveling every single week, four or five days a week. And that is not sustainable. And I didn't want that life. Yeah. But I, it was what I had, could do at, at the time. So it was a big mind, mindset shift. And I deliberately wanted to do stuff in my local community. And then I started to work on this data center project because we have this situation up in northern Norway where electricity is 100% green and it's actually super cheap. So it's the cheapest electricity in all of Europe. And then I had this idea to, um, to work on uh, creating the largest data center project in the world. We got to some uh, land, some 640,000 square meters with uh, access to a lot of this green and, and cheap power. And we put together a team to uh, realize this uh, data center project. And how did uh, you fund this? Did you have to raise again? Yeah, then I raised. Center? Then I raised, yeah, two million euros from. I had six hundred thirty-seven investors on my list, uh, and I reached out to every one of them. How did uh, you used to reach out back then? Was that via email, email call? Yeah, or... email and yeah. calls and. Uh, the really hard way. Because <laughs> uh, there was no br there was no branding going on at that time, so you weren't front of mind. You were just appearing out of nowhere and trying to yep. build trust. Yeah, yeah, and that was doing it really the hard way. And now I I had worked with uh, in professional investors for seven eight years, so, uh, and I've raised a lot of capital, so I I kind of knew how to to do this, but still it was it was really a lot of work. Then, so we had this, this, uh, actually quite amazing project going on and we, we launched it on BBC world news, uh, live. We had like 800 international articles about the data center project. And then two of my co-founders took control over the project and sold it. Uh, so it was uh, kind of a backstabbing thing. <laughs> Wow. And, uh, and, uh, but it was, it turned out to be an, an exit, but not the type of exit I wanted because I wanted to actually create thousands of jobs, uh, in the local community. And, uh, so, uh, it was first extremely brutal, uh, and sort of my, uh, my company was taken away from me and it was sold for 10 million euros. Uh, and, uh, it turned out to be an exit that actually changed my life for the better, but it wasn't the way I wanted this. Uh, it was so many wrong things, um, in this, and we had this opportunity to create something completely amazing. And now sort of five years later, uh, this company came and purchased the same land for 20 million euros and they have the finance and the power to do this. Uh, they understood finally what, what. Yeah, what I saw. Yeah. Uh, so I, I've, I kind of felt that they understood it is a fantastic project, but um, I wasn't able to sort of pull this through as I as I wanted. So this is a founder's life. It, lots of ups and downs. It's sort of uh, having a really good time than having these uh, roller coaster experiences, and that's what you learn from. So I rem remember uh, when I went to uh, to court actually with Innotech Solar, together with the VC. Um, uh, the chairman of the board, who I, who I was the, the main VC I was working on, he, he said to me that, uh, Hovar, you know, this shouldn't be so, so bad for you. You, you have Norway's most expensive MBA, 52 million euros. It has cost us in, in equity. 
that you use, use that for something <laughs> <laughs> and that actually made a, a huge impression on, on me that's that's sort of, sort of the way to think about this that it's actually a very valuable learning experience uh don't think that this is like a failure it's okay we tried our best with really great people and and okay the chinese came and took that business we we um, the, the fundament wasn't uh, as as it was when we started uh Okay, we, we close it down and we move onwards. Then I kept the relationships with investors and they were full sort of integrity, no no sort of hard feelings. Uh, that's that's business. Sometimes it doesn't work out. Uh, yeah. And um, that was actually a very brutal, brutal thing uh, for uh, for me. But once I kind of got this mindset shift, it was like, okay, what can I use this experience for now? What 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 other stuff could I do? What what good could I do? And he, and here you are with your five different companies because of all of that that you are now pushing in. So how yeah. is your current companies and where are they each at in funding? Where are they, you know, and how do you like, dive, you know, cut up your time between LinkedIn? How much time, by the way, do you spend on LinkedIn per day? I think this will really intrigue people. Uh, on LinkedIn per day, it varies, but uh, it's like one to two hours. Okay, so uh, I would say uh, sometimes much more. When you when you have active posts, it can be much more. <laughs> sometimes when you were like learning, you're telling me you're spending even more time when you were in learning phase. You're like, Mel, I'm doing eight hours a day, but time yeah. time must yeah. you must have to t- divest so much time into your companies and everything yeah. how do you kind of you know how do you allocate time i guess between your companies your funding your linkedin personal brand like how do you actually arrange all that for your objective yeah so that's a it's a very good question and there is no uh, sort of definitive answer on uh, on that because it actually changes from week to week i'm i'm spending most of my time on whatbots because i'm ceo there and uh, this autonomous robot company uh, where we try to create a really yeah really cool uh, robot for solving a big uh, sort of industry problems for fish farmers so that yeah, tell that's us a... more about what bot cuz yeah, it's a so... really cool project <laughs> so what was um, uh, this was uh, after my my uh, my two exits uh, i had this uh, situation where i could do exactly what i wanted to do and then sort of autonomous robots has always been very fascinating as like what what could you actually create of good value with um yeah on the robot side and then i was uh, talking with one engineer that had this uh this idea uh, and and this was actually back in 2014 we had we sat and discussed sort of uh, what we could do on uh, on this side but then I didn't have the fundament in place to um, to um, sort of launch this because it's a lot of effort to get things funded. But uh, sort of fast forward to uh, 2019, uh, I had my exit and I had the fundament in place and the timing was right. And we sat down and discussed like, this could actually be really cool to, to do because there are many elements that sort of, sort of fit together. It's like creating a lot of value for the end customer. It's a, a, a very good business that you can also capture. Because what was the problem that you're fascinated by? Just yeah. so the audience can yeah, hear. So- yeah, the problem with the, the fish farmers uh, have is that when you have a, a net in sea, it starts to grow with algae from very early on. And uh, anything that's at sea grows with algae. And it blocks the oxygen for entering into the fish net. And it keeps the sort of used water inside the fish pen. And it ha- uh, so it, it kind of serves as a barrier. In, yeah, bacteria and uh, and um, viruses may sort of attach uh, to this. And once you you start to clean uh, this with high pressure underwater robots, then you create these algae clouds that gets into the the gills of the fish, and uh, it's uh, really bad for fish um, fish health. But this is how ninety eight percent of the industry is doing it today. And uh, there must be a better way that uh, where you can sort of create an autonomous robot who who brushes the net continuously every day, so that nothing attaches to the net. So, 
So it only becomes a problem if you if you let the net stay intact for like two three weeks, then uh, then it starts to to grow a lot of algae on it. But if you if you brush it every day, and you have this robot like a vacuum cleaner at home, uh, if you have this robot who goes around in this uh, environment and brushes off uh, biofilm every day, you, you you kind of take away this problem, and that has a huge value for uh, for fish farmers. So. And uh, we here we have this ten billion dollar uh, fish farming industry right outside our uh, our door here in in Norway. So uh, you have a big home ad advantage instead of working like in U.S. or in in Germany or in other places. You 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 actually have an advantage being located where you are located. So that yeah, that was a lot of sort of appealing things with uh, this um, autonomous robot and. And then you you need actually artificial intelligence and and machine learning to make this robot work on its own. So it's supposed to work hundred percent on its own, no human interaction, and that's completely possible uh, to do. So we set out to do this in in two thousand and nineteen. Took one yeah one year to to get it funded. Um, or sort of to first to to set the fundament right to have customer interviews, talk with investors, talk with global experts, and then uh, sort of half year to get it funded. Then we, yeah, then we kicked and that one And with off. your funding that time, what was, were you sort of using your personal brand already by then when you went in no. or so, this is much so this, more later that you yeah, so this happened. Yes, yeah, so this happened sort of uh, in 2019. So I was starting to uh understand sort of the impact of linkedin but um and this happened sort of at the same time as um as nanice uh, we found uh, founded nanice also in 2019 and tell us um, a little bit about nanice and what the problem is that yeah. we're trying to solve in nanice so for for nanice uh, that's a sort of completely different uh problem and industry um and it's my own fascination about uh um, how can you design uh, sort of a surface uh, that nothing attaches to? Uh, and because we are cleaning our cars, we are cleaning our windows. My my eyewear gets dirty. Uh, our clothes get dirty. And it's like, why is that? <laughs> why hasn't anyone solved this this dirt problem before? Yeah, I, I've wrote uh, even this LinkedIn post about sort of my my fascination about uh, this uh, woman with uh, the the white dress who uh, someone sort of accidentally spilled wine on on her and everything just went straight off the dress and that was like my fascination with nanotech. It's like wow, this this has really potential if you can do do this in the right way. And, uh, and then I met this uh, PhD uh, with uh, with experience in material science and uh, and uh, nanotechnology, and we, we kicked off this conversation about what what's the problem actually? What why hasn't anyone solved this? We had this sort of back and forth process for a year, and then we figured out that this was actually something that was possible to solve in a in a novel way. And uh, we kicked off the fund, the company. I funded the the first part of it. We had some proof of concepts, and we got the we, we within a year we actually developed the the most slippery surface in the world. It's like much yeah. lower friction than Teflon. Um, it uh, you you can you can paint with an indelible marker on it, and it nothing sticks to it. I think it's completely a world changing company in that. Uh, does the material change at all the feel or anything if it was put on a dress? Because I know that was where your first fascination started is with a dress. And yeah, is so, it, so we, are, know... we are not uh, not on a dress yet or, or on clothes uh, yet. So first now we're working on glass and plastic and metals. Then uh, we will hopefully get to also uh, some clothes after. <laughs> You're focused on cars at the moment then yeah. but so, so it won't change the surface so much when you're applying it to a solid surface but i'm guessing the difficulty will be when you move into move movement in material so, how to keep it the same movement yeah so so it's not the the, the first product here is not uh, not for clothes uh, because no. you you wash them in the in the washing machine it's like very flexible so it's Got a it. different type of problem so 
we decided to to yeah do the sort of cleaning uh, so that you don't have to clean your car or you don't yeah. have to wash your windows uh, first and then and then there are so many applications where where you could use this coating that's part of the problem and that's part of also the what's quite exciting about this uh, company that you can use this surface for so many things like imagine you don't have to like dirt doesn't build up or, or stick to a solar panel yeah uh, which has enormous value i want to go back to just figuring out so the time allocation like you're doing yep. all these cool projects how do you get the time to diverse time to creating content even you know when you've got all these companies going on like how do you manage that yeah, the, the content creation is usually on the, on the evening times. <laughs> okay. So okay. when I have time to think and uh, no phones and, uh, and emails. Uh, so, but uh, how do I divide my time? I, I, I have weekly check-ins with all my five teams. Yeah. The one hour per week where we, uh, with no agenda to, to sort of check in and discuss what's going on. And yeah. I'm, I'm very... So in, in all my startups, uh, there are really good teams um, and there are um, uh, also also leaders who, who take on the CEO responsibility. So, so I actually don't have a desire to be CEO. I, I want to work with brilliant people. So they are they take charge in the sort of day to day business and and I can sort of be there and support and uh, be yeah be sometimes a mentor, sometimes just a good good person to talk to discuss yeah. challenges and what's what's coming up in the different companies so in what it's a little bit different because there i i am ceo so so there i uh, I, I spend more time on on what and sort of driving and, and developing this uh, autonomous robot um yeah. whereas versus in uh, in nanize it's it's more sort of uh, weekly calls and discuss and uh, and um, yeah some some strategy and sort of board meetings and these these type of things and uh, also in the other some of the other companies it's it's like uh, weekly check-ins and uh, and uh, yeah being a sort of an, an active partner but not not spending like uh, days and days on on uh, on each company so most of my time is on whatbots when i guess you're putting content out there now regularly like what have you found is the key ingredients for success yeah for me it's um it's a combination of having the right audience and uh triggering curiosity uh like the opening uh, opening line and to to get people to click see more is super important um yeah the dwell time how long they end up spending yeah. so and but but even before you get to the dwell time you actually have you have to 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 grab their attention yeah and if you if you don't do that then the doesn't help uh, how good the content is so yeah it's you, you kind of have to to write the opening lines in a, in a yeah interesting way so that you 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 stop the scroll basically on, uh, on linkedin and do you find this types of particular types of content that really works for you over other types from you know experimenting that now looking back and going you know what is there better ideas and some ideas just like there was better ideas of what yeah. companies you fund and what yeah. you don't is there better media formats and other ones that have worked for you particularly like for these investment type that are interested in how to use it is there you know certain tips that you've picked yeah. up going okay that's better yeah, yeah personally i think uh, video is actually very very effective um, because it lets people feel you who you are or feel the enthusiasm uh, in a in a completely different way than sort of reading a text um, so so I'm, I'm i'm starting to like video a lot um, but also texts and sort of these uh, carousels and and these uh, they, they actually work but i think sort of it's it's important to have a balance of, of different things it doesn't have to be just one thing like I can't do like video every uh, other day or every week. Uh, that's that's just too much, and it takes quite some time to to prepare some of this content. So like to write a post could easily be two hours. 
Correct. Uh, for for me at least. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you need to think through and sort of uh, there are many iterations also and and uh, sometimes I get uh, feedback on the on the post or, or sort of this works this doesn't work and uh, and that's also very well very helpful to to kind of get uh, someone else's perspective on uh, on uh, on the content. So yeah, uh, and mean, then you can improve your game in in actually in a nice way because you you actually get feedback also in the content creation process, not just yeah. after posting. Uh, and also one thing that you did and that stands out is you went in with that infographic style, which not many people did. And mm. we thought, let's go in with something really unique. And I guess it was like, you know, because people did video, people did this, but there was this one format that was, I don't know, for me, it was really appealing to me and it was appealing to you at the same time. And yep. I, I really wanted to do it because I was like really inspired. And mm. when we were talking, it was your you know, why you invested into these really fascinating companies we've been talking about. It was interesting and it was interesting and in how we thought about it. And it looks like they've really, like, we didn't know if it's going to work, but it's real worked out. It's worked really incredibly well for you. And people yeah. are calling it posters or they're calling it yeah. infographic. They're calling it different things. To, to it. How was that experience for you, you know, going to market with something, I guess, creative yeah. out there, different? Yeah, no, that, that's... I, I think th those are standout sort of pieces that it's, you don't see too many of them uh, on LinkedIn. And, uh, and I think uh, at least it grabs my attention when I see something like that. And, and uh, I thought it was actually a quite a yeah, very appealing way to tell the story. It may look sort of a little crowded when you first look at it, but once you kind of start to study, it's like, wow, this is actually quite interesting. And I had that response from, from many people that they, uh, they uh, when they when they started to look at it, it's like hmm, very interesting uh, to to kind of follow the thought process for my business framework on uh, on these uh, companies. So now we have uh, on Thursday we have the uh, Lazera coming up, um, yeah, and uh, on the business framework. So that will be interesting. Yeah, you've got you're sharing all your business frameworks, and yeah, you're really um, standing out. So what's the plan for you to continue to stand? out on LinkedIn? Like how are you going to continue to show up there? Are you going to have a consistent play? What are you thinking now about, you know, as you're getting more learnings, you're working through your link, like what, what are you thinking about the landscape and what you plan to do and disrupt over there? So I, I know that LinkedIn is going to be very valuable for me in the next five years. It is already very valuable, but sort of being present, being showing up every week, uh, being active uh, has a lot of value for me. And I know that this is a very good way to connect with also new people, uh, get more insights, more um, engagements from, uh, from um, people across the world. Um, so now it's like 10, 11,000 people or connections, so followers on, on LinkedIn, which is like up almost 100% or actually more than 100% since a year ago. Um, yeah. And you've grown so really think, quickly as well recently. Like I think when we met, it was 9,000 or something. And like I just checked today, you're up yeah. to 11,000. So you're growing very, yeah. very it's, fast uh, now. Very your... fast. Yeah. And and also this part of this is also be, because of this uh, sort of Founder Sunday and this uh, sort of Founders community that we just... Yeah, to, tell us about uh, that. Tell us about the just, Founders Sunday. Yes. Yeah. Just, we just... It's so easy to feel alone as a founder when you're founding your company, and and I heard I've had this feeling, and I've heard so many others who sort of felt the same way. So I wrote a post about this, uh, sort of yeah, feeling alone, and it really resonated with a lot of people. And uh, I've wrote this post on a Sunday. Then uh, we decided to uh, like a, a little group of people to let's do this every Sunday. Let's. Let's just be here. Let's try to connect with the other founders on LinkedIn um, and see see where it takes us, basically. And now there's like more than 500 people who, who joined this sort of little attempt and actually super interesting people joining the group uh, and, and actually also very active people. So what, well, why Sunday? Well, many 
founders actually work on Sundays. That's sort of the brutal life. <laughs> Being a founder, you, you, you have to put in hours even during weekends. Uh, so yeah, so then we kind of started this Founders Sunday, and and um, I met with a yeah a number of these who um, who joined and uh, sort of built my network quite quite far uh, uh, through this group. And uh, founders are very interesting yes. people. They 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 challenge the the status quo in so many different ways. Um, and, uh, also when, when they when you are active on the Sunday, you're actually most, you're, you're most likely also quite active on LinkedIn in, in general. So it's actually quite a good audience to, to have, and especially when I, because I want to have all this sort of paid forward, uh, sort of share insights. And, and I think that's uh, without really an ask, I'm not asking these founders to do anything. So, yeah. so, um, I think it's it's good also for engagement on on the post. It builds the network. You kind of find like minded people. Uh, yeah. So it's good in so many ways. <laughs> I, I mean, I checked out the group myself, and anyone listening on, if you actually want a group that's not about selling and that's actually just about connecting, this is one of the unique groups, I guess, on LinkedIn that is actually there to help because a lot of groups you'll join, and then the next thing you get is connection request going hey you're part of this group i want to sell you x and that's one reason why i haven't really participated in groups so much i mean i appreciate some of the groups that share my content into their groups and that's really nice and so forth but this is a group that i really saw that you're engaging and maybe i missed this i think when you join you should introduce yourself to the group and what you're doing um i think i missed that part but i realized that that's the thing to do when you get on the group with yeah, that, that's that's one one way to do it. But but also in so it groups on LinkedIn, LinkedIn actually doesn't seem to work out that well. No. So so sucks it, usually. Yeah, and so so but it's this Founder Sunday is actually not really about the group. It is about the one to one connection that founders can build within the group. So it's actually the activity that that is happening outside the group that is the most interesting. So. For me, I think I've connected with probably 95%, maybe 100% of mm-hmm. those who are in the group. So that's like 500 founders uh, or co-founders or founders to be around the world. And what I see is that uh, the engagement on my posts are definitely going up because mm. I write also for founders and, and interesting insights. So for me, it's it's helping. And and um, yeah, just having this sort of little community that... That uh, it's it's growing. Like last week, I, I think it was like seventy new founders who, who, j- yeah. who joined us, uh, and it keeps on growing uh, like like that for week by week. So I think the momentum of this group is actually going to increase quite a lot. Uh, it, like five months, ahead, six months ahead, it's going yeah. to be much much bigger. So and and as you say, it's no selling. It's that's not the point. Uh, we we don't want people who, who sell into this group. We we want people who want to pay it forward, uh, and uh, so that's that's the hope. But really, the, the magic is in the one-to-one connections. So if you if you want to to like anyone want to join as a founder, they well here's five hundred other founders that you can like instantly connect with. Um, well, that's actually quite cool, huh? Yeah, I think so. At least. Yeah, awesome. Well, I've really had such a fascinating talk. I love learning about all your companies. I mean, we only got into, I think, two of your most recent ones. So if you're interested in all of Havad's companies, he posts about each of them each Thursday and reveals why he's invested in them, what the company's up to, shows the product off because they're all just as interesting as what bots and nanis that you heard about and all his previous ventures there, I think, is equally fascinating as each other and I couldn't believe when I met you and you had like five equally cool companies and I was like really is that really possible but you have really shown us that you know having good teams around you enable you to do so much and also Mm folks you also have enough time to even produce content you know at the end of it because a lot of time people would say I've got five companies and I wouldn't be able to have time for personal brand but you really proved that model and that theory wrong which i really appreciate 
And I think it, it should inspire other founders to listen and go when they always giving the excuse, I don't have enough time. I don't know if it's going to work. You've really shown today that you've got to play the long game. This is the new funding game. This is about building trust online more than ever. So you've given me a lot of confidence and you speak exactly what I think. So, you know, a lot of the time I didn't have to speak. Was there any last comments or any insights you want to share as your final thoughts as we end? Yes, I, I think uh, what you said now, uh, sort of, you don't have time. It's like you don't have time to don't do it. It's, it's kind of the opposite. So, and that this is what sort of I figured out over the last few years is that doing less is actually enabling me to do much more. <laughs> it's quite a paradox, actually. But if you want life balance and you want this sort of um, this uh, inner peace and, and uh, you, you, you can't work 18 hour days. And, and if you do that, I think you're actually working in the wrong, uh, you, you, you're not doing it right. Um, and for me, it's, it's not about the, the amount of hours I'm putting in, uh, so much anymore. It's much more about quality, uh, in those hours I actually put in and sort of working on the right stuff instead of just working, working, working. So, um, and, and how do you work on the right stuff? Well, you challenge your mindset, you, you talk to global experts, you, you, uh, you get all these external inputs that sharpens your, your mindset and your brain. Uh, so that works for me at least. So, and then you get to meet a lot of super fascinating people on, on, on the way also. Absolutely. Absolutely. And putting your thoughts out there consistently, I think brings so much to you. I can see like, it's brought you so much new people, so much brilliant people, talent. It's brought you investment. It's brought you connection, mm -hmm. which I can see you really value. So Thank you for sharing and inspiring other founders to do what it takes really now with the investment round, with what it takes to be truly a leader, I think, is so different to what it was. Um, so thank you for being authentic and open and sharing that so other people can be inspired. Thank Again, you're you listening care. to Innovative Minds. Tune in every Thursday and spark your mind. <laughs>